Hello and uh, welcome to this video lecture on the amendment process. I am uh, making this so you have it. I'm going to ask you a couple of points to uh, to stop what you're actually doing and, and maybe hit pause or if I if I talk too quickly, um, you might want to hit pause as well and just make sure you get the information down. It does correspond correspond to your to your notes packets um, and also included in here is a journal entry. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please, you know, feel free to, sh to shoot me an email or stop by the room um, at any point. And I'll, I'll happily answer any questions that you have um, and, and if you, or if you need any clarification. So without further ado, here we go. So here's your Constitution Roadmap. It is important to have a, a good idea of what the general layout is. Um, it will help you uh, in a number of places, but it is important to know that First off, the legislative branch was created in Article 1, executive branch is 2, judicial branch 3. Um, then we'll get into the state relations as well, particularly when we talk about federalism in the uh, upcoming days. Um, Article 5, amending the Constitution, which is going to be your major important part for today. And then uh, Article 6 is the supremacy clause, obviously very important when we, when we get to federalism as well. And then Article 7 talks about ratifying the Constitution. So there's your basic constitutional roadmap and how it's set up and what, they, uh, what each of the articles is going to discuss and talk about. So I want you to get out your journals and write today's date at the top there. Um, you can draw a line underneath your journal that we did last time and then write today's date and begin this again no reason to to uh to write down the prompt or the question here at all because i again i know what those are so um after i speak here i'm going to ask you to pause and 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 really reflect on this but i do want you to know that there have only been 27 amendments to the constitution obviously you know that um, our amendments quiz is, is coming up um, but there's 27 of, of amendments to the constitution that means really in our history um, so from ratification on you've had 27 amendments first 10 were the bill of rights happened pretty rapidly again ratification really took place because of, a, of a, the agreement that they would add a bill of rights so the question is is some say that that 27 is too few as the founders made it too difficult to amend and that congress is quote a burial ground for amendments in other words that is a pig going through two pythons. Do you agree, disagree, and why? Again, did they make it too difficult or is it just right? One, again, that one, one congressional member said that, that's a, uh, that Congress is a burial ground for amendment, amendments. The, another one actually said that it's a pig going through, through two pythons, meaning that a pig would never make it. The pythons would, would, would kill the pig long before he ever got through uh, both of them. So is it too difficult? or is it just right? Please explain your answer and pause me here. And when you're done writing, you can get back to your, to your notes section. So today's goals. Um, one, there's a lot of information here. We gotta get through this amendment process and it's, it is a, a lot of information and I, we'll cover it pretty quickly, but make sure that you are paying attention. Um, and two, the describing federalism, it's a very, very brief introduction to federalism. We'll cover that over the next couple days in class. I do like this little, uh, this picture here to the side. Uh, because <laughs> one I was told it's not actually real at all, uh, but it still makes me chuckle. So enjoy. So a few key terms. One, what is an amendment? It changes something. In this case, we're talking obviously about the Constitution, but you can amend anything um, and it's going to basically change it. Then we have more, more uh, important words for, for our purposes for the Constitution, but a formal amendment is a change or addition to the written language of the Constitution. It actually changes the Constitution itself. The wording is changed. Something is changed about it. Um, an informal amendment is, is not a change of written word, but a change in the understanding or our interpretation of the Constitution. So formal is an actual substantive written change and informal is simply a change in our understanding. And we'll get to a couple of those examples here shortly. A convention, most of you know what this is, simply a meeting called for a specific purpose. Different states handle this a little bit differently, but um, 
if they have to call a convention, uh, the, the states generally will handle that and, and go through this. So there's four possible ways to amend the Constitution. I'm going to give you the first two and the most common two uh, at the beginning. And then the other way is uh, the other two ways, I should say, is there's a few key things that we will discuss. But the first way is simply proposed by Congress by two thirds of a vote in both houses, both houses, meaning the House of Reps and the Senate, two thirds of vote. Then they send it and that can be ratified by three quarters of the state legislatures. So the state legislatures would get it and vote on it. And if they pass it, it becomes um, it becomes a part of the Constitution. 26 of the 27 amendments have been done this way, proposed by Congress by two thirds vote in both houses and then ratified by three quarters of the state legislatures. An easy way to think about this is if you're having trouble remembering which is which numbers where uh, it's a little hill first and then a bigger mountain second. So little hill is two thirds and then a bigger mountain is obviously a higher amount, the three quarters of state legislatures. And then the other way, the one amendment, one of the 27 has been ratified this way. You propose it by Congress by two thirds of a vote in both houses, and then it's ratified by conventions in three quarters of the states. How you're selected and how the state conventions are selected do, do vary a bit from state to state, but generally conventions are uh, of people, um, just citizens, normal citizens that are selected to go represent uh, their, their, their area or their district or, or however the state breaks it down. But three quarters of the states have to, have to um, abide by this for it to, to pass, to get to the, to, get the uh, amendment on the books. Um, only one amendment has been done this way. And the reason was it was, you know, the repeal of prohibition was done this way. And the reason was, is they thought that they would handle it by convention rather than by legislature, because the convention, it would have a better pulse on what the actual people, what the citizens of the country wanted. And therefore they sent this to the conventions rather than sending it to the state legislatures. Two other possibilities. Again, none, they have not happened yet, but you could see it. I mean, it's certainly feasible and possible, but propose that a national convention when requested by two thirds of state legislatures is one way. Um, and then from there it goes to, would have to be ratified by three quarters of state legislatures. Another and, and final way that this could, a constitution could, could be amended is proposed at a national convention when requested by two thirds of the state legislatures and then ratified by conventions in three quarters of the states. You'll notice here, Congress doesn't play any role in either of these, these options of the four. Again, these last two that haven't been done, there's no Congress mentioned. And everyone always asks, well, why would they do, why would they do that? Well, the idea is if you're passing a law that impacts or, or amending the constitution that would impact members of Congress, they oftentimes wouldn't obviously vote for it. So this gave the option of sending through an amendment without consulting the, the central government, or the, the, the federal government. It hasn't been done, but it could be done. One area where this, you could actually see this maybe happen would be through term limits for Senate or House of Reps members. They obviously are probably, or not, most likely are not going to favor term limits because they don't want to work themselves out of a job. So therefore they're probably not going to pass that. What's one way around it? proposing it a national convention by state legislatures and then ratifying it at the state legislature level or by convention level. So that's one area where this would be a possibility. So basic legislation, informal changes, these again are not changing the written word um, to the constitution. They simply are changing our understanding. And there's five examples here and I'll go into them a little bit more on each slide. But just so you know, um, a few things by basic legislation, simply introducing uh, bills, uh, actions of the president, decisions of the Supreme Court, activities of political parties and um, customs and uses, just generally how we've adapted over time. So informal amendment through basic legislation. Uh, this is one way to change our informal understanding. Uh, we can do this through, through passing of laws, which can later become amendments, which is our first example, or you can simply have the interpretation or passing of law that can, can interpret or, or, or provide more clarity on something within the constitution should you need it. Um, Congress proposes laws that can change the way government operates. Where the uh, US constitution is silent, Congress can act. Um, who becomes president 
if president and most vice president are both dead. We do know that we have an amendment for that now. But prior to this, they had the Presidential Succession Act um, before it was the constitutional amendment was there. Um, and the Presidential Succession Act did lay out who would be who would respond and who would be president should should something happen to the president. Um, Congress may also define unclear language, such as areas where the Commerce Clause is there. Again, not a formal change, but an informal change to our understanding of, of something within the Constitution. Informal amendment, this is by executive agreement. A pact between the president and a leader of a foreign country, for example. Uh, an example here is the U.S. Um, president of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada agree to support each other in a war. This is simply an executive agreement that does not, it's not amending anything within the Constitution, but again, it does change some of the uh, repercussions or certainly the obligations of the United States, but again, it's not part of the formal amendment process. It's considered to be informal. Informal amendment, court cases. This is a really common area where we've changed our understanding of something written in the Constitution. The judicial branch of the government can make decisions in legal cases that change how the government functions. Uh, in the case of Marbury versus Madison, the US Supreme Court decided that it could decide when laws proposed by Congress and or enacted by the president are constitutional or unconstitutional. There's a number of court cases that you can point to that have changed our understanding of certain things um, within the Constitution. It is not, the court cases don't add amendments to the Constitution. They don't change the written or formal wording of the Constitution, but they greatly change our understanding of, of it and our interpretation of it. Uh, a good example, there's a number of these, but a good example was uh, for a long time, same-sex marriage was outlawed in, in most places or a number of places. The Supreme Court ruled in Obergefell versus Hodges that marriage could be between two parties and it does not and it can be same sex couples and that marriage is that's that's a right that changed our understanding didn't change any written words to the Constitution, but it did change Americans understanding of the Constitution. And political parties, these are all informal. Um, because they change so much and, and some of the things that have happened, particularly the electoral process um, and the nomination process, because political parties are not mentioned in the Constitution. And as noted in class, and as we will note again and again, the founders and the framers had, had a lot of problems with political parties, and they did warn about the trouble with factions, um, whether it's the Federalist Papers or Washington's Farewell Address, they do talk a, a, a great deal about political parties and what, and what problems they could create. Um, so this is an informal process that that our that's we've kind of interpreted as being part of our constitution. Uh, our political parties decide how we nominate our candidates, how the caucuses and the primaries are run, and the nomination process is run. Um, political parties also are very active in when presidents and members of Congress make decisions. Political parties direct their influence and tell their their membership. A number of which way to vote or how to vote on something it's not uncommon again this they're not mentioned there's no formal amendment process here or formal amendment that happened but it does change our it has changed our understanding of the constitution and the last slide the last informal amendment process or informal changing our understanding of the constitution is the customs and usage these are unwritten customs that shape the way government functions Examples here, one is, is the, the Constitution does outline that the president will need help, that there will be assistance from, from members that, that they name. We've expanded it, started originally with basically three or four, some argument there, three or four. Um, but the heads of the 15 executive departments make up the president's cabinet. Well, the most recently created cabinet position is Homeland Security, and that was created um, in response to 9-11. So it's a fairly new organization that was stood up. Um, but this again is a, a circle of, of advisors that are pretty close to the, the president, not necessarily the closest advisors anymore. I kind of, I feel like that's, I made a mistake by including it that way. Um, on, on the slide there, it, it, it is a close circle of advisors in some instances, but they are not by any means the closest, uh, the chief of staff and the White House staff would, would, be, a, would be more trusted by the president. But they knew when they wrote the Constitution that the president would need help. They did not envision, nor does it say anything about the 15 executive departments that make up the president's cabinet. Um, and so 
those again that's informally done uh, for again for the for the president to help run the day-to-day -day activities of the government also another informal or, or informal change through customs and usages this idea of senatorial courtesy um, the, by custom senators from the president's party and the state involved approve presidential nominees such as federal judges or u.s marshals if trump wants to put in a federal judge in say one of indiana's federal courts he would call um a senator from indiana of the same party so he's a republican so he is going to to call uh, todd young the considered to be the senior senator who's also a republican he will call him and say senator young what do you think about so-and-so for a federal judgeship i'd like to nominate him if senator young says yes that person will go they will go forward with the nomination process if senator young says no the president will likely withdraw that nomination if he doesn't withdraw that nomination and that gets to senate for a vote the other senators will join forces with senator young and not nominate or not allow that nomination to go through it is called senatorial courtesy there's a lot of criticism about this from from a number of places but they do feel like the senator has the senate has too much power in this instance because they basically get to name or nominate and confirm those federal judges um, it's usually enough when a, when a president asks if a senator says no it's usually enough that they will not nominate that that person that brings us to the end um, if you have any questions at all please you know please certainly shoot me an email or stop by the room and and, and ask any questions that you have I'm, I'm happy to help uh, wherever I can and answer any questions uh, that, that you may have thank you I hope you found this somewhat helpful and I will see you soon. Take care.